this panel today is a portfolio with a purpose. So today we have Louise McGuan, the founder of JJ Corey Irish Whiskey, Peter Allison, the head of sales for North America at Adam Brands, and Martin Lucas, <laughs> the vice president of sales at Dictador. So, and I will be your moderator. So the reason we wanted to focus on this topic is because one of the most prominent trends in modern alcohol history is the consumer shift from brand loyalty to experimentation and drinking across categories. And this has fundamentally changed the way that brands interact with consumers, communicate with consumers, and build their brand portfolios. So if you look back a few decades when this industry was largely run by your big international corporations, the way that they set up their portfolios was one brand, one category. And they filled their portfolios for each category. Well, now with the rise of craft spirits, we're seeing a lot more unique brand makeups. We're seeing one brand, one category. So think Tito's. We're seeing one brand spread across multiple categories. And so today we've brought together our experts who are gonna talk about the benefits and opportunities of the different ways you can build your portfolio. So um, next I'm gonna hand it off to Louise McGuan. I am Louise McGuan. I'm the founder of JJ Kari Irish Whiskey. And um, what I'll do today is I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of sort of uh, perspective about who we are and what we do really quickly up front. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about how we manage our portfolio. Uh, we're a very, very young brand. Uh, we came out with our first whiskey only in uh, September of 2017. So we have about two years of full trading under our belt. Um, we're a whiskey bonder, an Irish whiskey bonder. And very specifically what that means is that in the context of Irish whiskey, uh, I don't have a distillery. I will never have a distillery. Uh, rather, I source whiskey from, in cask from the older distilleries around Ireland, uh, and then I blend it to create our own unique house style. And now, as the Irish whiskey is in very significant growth, I also source new make whiskey from a lot of the new distilleries that are opening up around the country. So my job really is to kind of curate Irish whiskey flavors, if you like. For us building our portfolio, you know, the old way just really wasn't going to work because Irish whiskey is a noisy category, you know, craft spirits is a very, very noisy category as well. So we had to take a very different sort of and very, very considered approach to our portfolio. In the last 12 months, I've released uh, eight whiskeys, sorry, seven whiskeys, believe it or not, just in the last 12 months alone. Um, one of those is just our standard workaday whiskey, and then all the rest of them were sort of smaller editions. Um, in the couple of hundred bottle ranges. Um, in the last year, we've found ourselves very unexpectedly, to be honest, uh, 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 becoming one of the most collectible Irish whiskies on the market. Um, to give you an example, we launched a whiskey with Milroy's of Soho there a couple of months ago, it was about 280 bottles, and it sold out in 15 minutes online. Um, we, la we launched a whiskey there locally, um, in County Clare where we're from and we had people driving from all over the country and indeed people sending people to come and buy it from all over the world and it sold out in four hours. So every time we, we, we launch a small whiskey these days, it just, it sells out effectively. Um, that's me and Blaze, I thought that's the, 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 I thought that's what I was speaking to. But yeah, this, this is, um, we have a very small team. That's our rack house in Ireland that you can see there where we uh, mature and um, create our whiskies. So our portfolio approach then, um, again, was very, very considered. Um, when we first launched in uh, 2017, um, I wanted to do all sorts of really exciting and innovative things because that's what you want to do as an entrepreneur. I'd spent 20 years working for Diageo and I wanted to really kind of break out from that sort of corporate feel. Uh, but I knew that as our first whiskey onto the market, we had a huge amount to prove. Uh, you know, we source whiskey for a living, we don't distill it. That means people are even more critical of you when you hit the market first. So I ensured that all of our um, communications around our whiskey was very, very transparent. 
And the first whiskey that we ever came out with was a very traditional uh, blended Irish whiskey. Uh, and it's this one up here on the far right, the Gale with the green label. Um, we, pushed, we took some of our best stock, some of our oldest stock, and we created that blend. Uh, and the reason that we did that as our sort of first iteration is that I knew we had a huge amount to prove um, in our first portfolio release. So if I could begin to build our reputation with that one really, really good whiskey that we were using excellent quality, older, mature stock for, I knew that we could uh, sort of set ourselves on a path um, moving forward that, that we'd have a little bit less to prove. So the second whiskey we came out with was, uh, a, again, a traditional single malt. It's that red one there on the left called the Fitlock. Um, again, uh, we, we, it was a very, very considered uh, release. Traditional single malt Irish whiskey, no surprise there. Uh, just get it out the door, make sure it's really, really high quality. Um, and both of those releases paid off very well for us from a reputation standpoint. They were very well received by the critics. Um, you know, they were getting 90 plus points everywhere. They won a lot of awards. Uh, and it, and we, they were the only two whiskies that we had on the market for approximately a year because I needed them to just solidify and work on our reputation, essentially. Then last year, we started to do something a bit different. We started to do something called Bonders Blends. And Bonders Blends, again, are a means of us to sort of build our reputation. Um, we partnered with specific high-end whiskey accounts uh, like Milroy's, like Masters of Malt, like Whiskey Exchange, and we created small-scale releases for them. Um, very, very small scale, but again, very, very high quality, which was really important for us to build our relationship. So I felt like we had enough work done with our relationship, our, our reputation, so we started to experiment. And then a couple of months ago, we released this pink one down here, which is the world's first whiskey um, finished using mezcal and tequila casks. So nobody had ever done it before us. And then about a week after we did it, the SWA release relaxed the rules so that Scotch producers could do it. But it wasn't a gimmicky thing. It was a very sort of well thought out portfolio approach. I would have loved to have done that mezcal tequila thing day one, but I needed to ensure that our entire portfolio uh, proved itself and proved our, our quality cues and our reputational cues before I did that. So I always say then, this is my very kind of specific approach to portfolio uh, building. And, and any whiskey that we, we work with sits very squarely in one of these um, spots. So we will never release a whiskey unless it does one or more of these things. Builds our reputation, uh, produces a really significant brand building collaboration, um, is innovative, uh, and helps us with communication and PR and creates a bit of buzz. So anything that we release, any thoughts that we have about releases, no matter how much I want to release a really weird esoteric thing over here, if it's not sitting in that particular, in, in one of those buckets, um, it doesn't, doesn't fly for us. So I'll just talk you through that in a little bit more detail and maybe what I mean about that and again, what our approach has been. So the, the top left up here essentially is our reputation piece. So for me, this is whiskeys that we create that essentially they build our credibility with, in our case, whiskey enthusiasts, whiskey geeks, whatever you'd like to call them, uh, whiskey influencers. They're a very particular form of consumer uh, and they're vitally important for, for me in the whiskey category. They have to believe in me and they have to uh, tell their friends that they believe in me for me as a whiskey brand to be really successful. So for that reason, like I spend a lot of time on whiskey forums, like, a, like, a, like Facebook and Instagram and, and Twitter and, and the whiskey spheres on there, just listening to the chat and trying to get an understanding of how those guys are, are reacting to our whiskeys. So it's one of the reasons as well that from a reputational standpoint, the first few things that we launched were very straight and narrow. Um, you know, a, a blended Irish whiskey followed by a single malt Irish whiskey, no frills necessarily. And you'll see here as well, there's a bit of crossover with other releases that we've done. So I've got Master of Malls and Milroy's in there, because again, 
Um, the, collabor the collaborative stuff that we do very often sort of crosses over into reputation as well. Because nobody can build my reputation better than a customer, a respected customer like Milroy's. So I could sell 400 of these things a year, the Bonders blends, everybody wants to do them with me. I won't do them that often. I will only exclusively do them with um, brand building um, whiskey accounts. Uh, accounts that I know uh, consumers go to and listen to and believe in, in terms of whiskey recommendation. So for that reason, there tends to be crossover with our Bonders blends and uh, our normal releases. So then the collaboration piece, I mean, I've just touched on it there. Uh, you know, it's a massive part of our strategy. You know, every year we sit down and we think, okay, okay, in every market, what are the top 10 whiskey accounts to begin with? Or what are the top 10 super premium uh, or, or high, high, high end bars that we want to be affiliated with, uh, that we can collaborate with on a, on a really, really great whiskey that everybody will love. Um, this is a very sort of strategic piece on our end because it goes above and beyond building our reputation, although it does that. It allows us to have really intimate relationships with these accounts. Uh, you know, all the lads from, from Milroy's have been over to visit us in Ireland. The lads from Masters of Malt have come over to do the blend. You know, these are individual people, buyers in, and, and, and experts in accounts that I now have a great relationship with. They've had the JJ Corey experience. Um, I've sold them whiskey. They've sold it, sold it on immediately. It's sold out. Everybody's made money. Everybody's happy. Um, but it becomes a lovely, virtuous uh, reputation and collaboration circle, essentially. Um, communication and PR. This is sort of build in, build it, built into everything that we do. Um, you know, every time we do a sort of collaborative release, and again, you'll see crossover here, we're shouting about the fact that we're doing it in Milroy's. Milroy's are shouting about the fact that they're doing it to all their bartender friends. You know, it, it, it's ending up in the trade press. It's ending up in the consumer press. It's really important for us that anything that we release is worth communicating about and we'll know there'll be an interesting hook. So that's sort of built into everything that we do. But more, more than anything else, it's our innovation releases that, that really drive that communication and PR. Like, when I, when I released the Battalion, which is the Mezcal tequila finish, uh, I, I, I'll be frank with you, like I rushed that release because uh, I knew that there was going to be changes coming in the legislation around, you know, Scottish whiskey houses being allowed to do that. And I heard a rumor that somebody else was working on it in the Irish whiskey world. So I ensured that we, um, it was ready to go anyway, but I brought the release forward so that we would get the biggest push and the biggest um, uh, communication hit out of it. Um, no matter what, it's always the best to be known, I think anyway, certainly, in terms of innovation, to be the first to do something. You know, it, it puts you out there, it puts you top of mind of people, um, and it causes a huge amount of interest as well around whiskey consumers who maybe haven't seen something like that before. Um, so I guess to conclude, really, the, you know, that's really specifically our approach. Everything that we do has to fit into either reputation, collaboration, innovation, or communication. Uh, and, and usually they tend to sort of cross over. And then that gives us a perfect roadmap for our entire portfolio strategy moving forward. That's it. Hello. My name is Pete. And I, uh, I work for a company called Atom Brands. Um, you may or may not have heard of them, but I'm sure that through the space of this little talk that we're gonna we're gonna get to know each other pretty well. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much about my background, but I used to work for uh, the Macallan and before that uh, Gonzalez Bias, which is a Spanish sherry and, and, uh, and wine producer. So my background's really in whiskey, um, but now I'm with a a company which really specialises in innovation, incubation of of brands, and charging distribution. Up and up and up. Um, I was thinking about this whole topic and about who you guys might be. And I don't know you, but really, you could be producers starting your own company or salespeople, or perhaps you're uh, here from marketing or, or perhaps journalists. I don't know. But I wanted to look 
at my business model and the company I work with's business model and try and figure out how to translate that into, into your guys' world. Because I know that what we do is very asymmetric. We work within a fantastic loop that we've created, but how can we translate that into, into other people's world? That, that's what I'm gonna try and do today. So. Okay, so Atom Group is, uh, is, is the umbrella company for whom I work for. Atom Brands, specifically, uh, is the brand creators uh, behind uh, Able Force Bathtub Gin, Rumbullion, that boutique whiskey company, um, Airlight Lindsay, um, some really cool products that are uh, either established or becoming established. We're also in, in line with uh, Maverick Drinks, who's a UK distributor, one distributor of the year, uh, three years out of the last four. Absolutely killing it in terms of the UK stage. And Master of Malt, whom uh, who you referenced quite, quite nicely, who are an online specialist retailer. What we do in terms of our business is we circulate and we communicate to each other. So we're able to feed information in real life through from Master of Malt, which has um, a huge number of, uh, of unique clicks every, every week and people purchasing from all over the world. So we're able to gather live information um, all the time in terms of purchasing interests, where people are clicking on something and then going off of it again, where they're actually going through to purchasing, repeat purchasing, all that sort of stuff, which provides information to Atom Brands, which creates products. So that information, we're actually able to look at these trends and buying habits, and we're able to see that there's white spaces uh, or gray spaces in, in product mixes. And so, if we're looking, for example, at, uh, at, uh, at whiskey, Scotch whiskey, then one of the new products that we have coming out just now is called Airlight Lindsay. It's a 10-year-old Isle of Whiskey. And the reason why we did that, we're going to look at a slide just in a little bit to, to, to sort of analyze some of the data, but we knew that there was, a, that there was, an, there was an over-indexing of products being being bought from Isla, the flavor profile was very on trend. People were really ramping it up over the last four or five years. So we're looking at a huge interest, but a very small collection of actual distillers and brands coming out of Isla. So we're looking at that, at that white space. From Atom Brands, we sell to Maverick Drinks, where we're able to test our products in market, and that sells again through to Master Malt. So that's our circle. But in terms of you guys, you might not have the, the, the luxury of being, of being aligned with Master of Malt and Maverick Drinks. You don't have your inbuilt distribution and online capabilities. But what you can do is look a bit, a bit outside the box and look into, into other avenues to be able to figure that out. What we specialize in Atom Brands and Maverick Drinks is the innovation and seeding of products. That's our world. And to do that, we have what we call a playpen, which is uh, insight coming from Master of Malt, insight coming from the market, and insight coming from um, our new product development team that will create hundreds and hundreds of ideas that could fit within special, special categories. So we have our whiskies, we have our gins, we have our rums, we have our other um, spirits. And they will work continuously trying to come up with new ideas. From those new ideas, what we do in terms of our, our business model is we test it. And we test it through, um, through an analysis. So we put a small quantity of whatever product it is. We ideate if it gets through uh, a series of checks within internally then we make a very small quantity of that product and we put it onto Master of Malt to see how it does in real life. If we have success there and we get feedback coming through from, from real consumers, then it goes through that, that gate and it goes into our seed. And seeding is really where we chucked into our distributor Maverick Drinks. And we go into a few special, special accounts that we have good relationships with and we see how it does in the on-trade and we see how it does in the off-trade. If again, we see success coming back, 
then we're able to start bringing it out into full-scale UK distribution and also into small pockets of Europe, Asia, and America. And so we're able to go into export with these products. And if, again, we see success, then we're able to then move past that gate and into global distribution where we're charging that, that distribution to bring it up and up and up. Now, this is all really cool because we've been able to figure out how to do it as an internal sort of organization, but that doesn't help you in the slightest. This is just a little bit of a humble brag. So what I was thinking was, how can you do this methodology in real life? And what I thought was that in terms of innovating, you guys all work within this industry. So you know your stuff, like your smart cookies, and you know what you're going to make. But you need to be able to validate that product and see how it's going to do in its real life environment. And you have resources available. You know, one of, the, one of the pieces that we did recently was trying to validate a new product. And instead of doing it sort of top line and going through Master of Malt and going through, um, you know, uh, direct channels through, through the drinks industry, we went through Reddit. So we actually put together a, a brand proposition and then sort of tailored it down and put it to Reddit to see what the actual input would be from, from consumers. And we got hundreds and hundreds of live um, reactions to a new product which wasn't real yet coming through from an online community that, that, that's engaged. You can also do the same with your Facebook and your Instagram or whatever social channel that you might want to use but utilizing the digital space to be able to reach consumers within specialist fields is a really great way of being able to validate an assumption that you have that a product may or may not work. And you're able to get all this feedback in and use it. If at that stage you think, oh, okay, I've got this thing and it's going to work, you have to start putting your money where your mouth is and, and, and invest in, in, in creating the product. Now, you can do it at a big or little scale. Obviously, economy of scale means that more you make, less you're going to be spending and less you can sell it for, which means you're gonna, your volumes are going to go up. Cool. That's absolutely fine. But to essentially prove a concept of a product, you can also make a short run at a higher price and sell it within a community. That could be um, Master Malt or Whiskey Exchange or whatever avenue you want, or Amazon. These things exist for entrepreneurs and small scale. You can be big scale as well, but it can work in terms of small scale too. And that's what I really like about working in today's environment rather than 20 years ago. We just didn't have that at all. If your feedback is again positive, you're then able to go into distribution. And, and that's really just relationships. You know, all that we do is basically relationship building day in, day out, right? So if you're going into, a, into an account, be it on trade, off trade, uh, domestic or export, whatever it is, you know whether you've got a relationship with these guys or not. And you're able to chuck them a few bottles or be able to give them a little bit of a spin and say, look, get this behind your bar. See how it does over the course of two weeks. If you find that you're selling it, let me know. I'm interested. And that feedback, again, can be, can be validating your product range, your mix. The next slide, um, I'm going to show you essentially what our playpen looks like what our product creation and lab looks like, and it's this. We've taken a very different approach from a single producer sort of mix. Uh, we've created brands from, uh, from uh, absinthe to, I was trying to think of something getting the Z, but I can't mm -hmm. figure anyone out. Um, we work across all spirits categories. We work in whiskey, gin, rum, uh, liqueurs, specialist products, and it's really a way for us to be able to say, right, we get this information from Master of Malt, we see those blank spaces, can we create a product that's going to be able to fit in them? And we can. That's one of the joys of the, of the business that I work in, in that we produce lots and lots of different things, and we have ways and means of sourcing other spirits to be able to create them. So to use a to use some data from Master Malt, and you can use this from 
uh, something like Amazon, which or Master Mulch, essentially databases filled with information anyway. Whether you get it or not, you can look through your category and see that there's 40 different products within it, and that 13 of them are sold out, and that six of them have 200 reviews. That tells you that that category um, may be small, and it and it specialises, it sort of it focuses in on something specific, right? So with an Isle of Whiskey, we know that um, uh, only 12.5% of the distilleries in Scotland are based in Isla, right? There's only nine of them, um, and only seven of them are, are producing aged whiskey. But it accounts for 20% of the, of the sales, so it's over-indexing. That says to us that, that there's a space in there to be able to move in and be able to create uh, a product that's going to fit in. Um, it's also in huge growth right now, 18.8% year on year. That gives us another indication that's going to be uh, moving on up more as well. But essentially being able to validate your product mix with information is what I'm trying to get through to you, is, is, that, is that you can validate without spending money and you can create your product portfolio without having to over-invest. You know, you don't need to take a gamble all the time because you want to make something. You can do it through the eyes of the consumer too. And then finally, I want to show you what our gate system looks like. You can see in this slide that we've got these gates and what they actually look like in real life is this, which is a SWOT analysis. We all do SWOT analysis um, all the time, right? I mean, we do it in our heads mainly. We look at this, that strengths, um, uh, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But by essentially pimping that out, turning it into a into a large base where you're, where you're drilling down into things like where your revenue streams are, whether you can validate your product through revenue streams, whether you can validate your product through uh, cost structure and, and, uh, and channels, then you've got yourself a really, really strong case to be able to say, right, I can go to market with this, with this product. Very nice to be here, present in front of you. Uh, my background long, long time ago was in vodka. And here I am talking to you about Colombian rum. So <laughs> why this? Let's start this as a fairy tale. Long, long time ago, I received a phone call from current owner of uh, Dictador, who says, I think I bought a distillery. So then I say, I think maybe you had one too many mojitos if you're there in Colombia. I said, no, the juice is damn good. And I really think we should do something special about it. So this was exactly... 10 years ago, where he met the Para family that was doing this rum for decades locally in Cartagena de Indias. So on that day, we said to ourselves, we discovered by far the greatest spirit of Colombia. But what do we do about it? It's not like everybody is waiting for us there to, uh, to experience uh, what we have discovered. So the first thing we did was to look into the Nielsen reports for the global sales of aged rum. And there was no data. The reason for that was that H drum as a category was so small that it was not even present in the report. You could find there Captain Morgan, obviously Bacardi, but nothing about H drums. So we're here to talk about portfolio, but one thing I would like you to understand as well is that category equals portfolio. It's a portfolio of an industry. So we looked into that portfolio of aged rums. What have we discovered? A lot of parrots, a lot of old ships, uh, a lot of pictures of farmers cutting the sugar cane at certain angle. So that was the message that this category slash portfolio was using to communicate with clients. Obviously, it didn't work. If, if, if the category wasn't present in the Nielsen report, it means that it never managed to grow to sufficient amounts. So that was the first step for us uh, to prepare for launching of our products. So let's be different. Let's break what the, the, the category uh, had prepared for the consumer. Let's present the product as it was never presented before. Hence, we decided to go to 
towards this uh, lifestyle communication, which was supposed to be an invitation for a lot of consumers that never had a chance to try H drum to open the bottle and try uh, the, the, the beautiful content that we've prepared for them inside. So we realized very quickly that we want Dictador not to be a rum. Dictador is Dictador. It's a spirit of its own kind. And it's from the day one going outside of certain uh, group of portfolio products. So that was the first controversial approach to, mm, to do it. So today, some of you are preparing to start your own brand, or some of you just did, and you're probably planning for years ahead. Some comments I would like to make to, to maybe make your way easier, but please try treat this as a subjective opinion, but this is what we've learned throughout that path. So the bigger is your portfolio, the more chances you have to succeed. Really, if you go fishing, and if, you, if you're gonna only put one bait into the, um, into the lake, you're decreasing your chances. So what we have prepared here is a platform where we try to speak universal language. So I'll show you in a second how our portfolio is split up, but we try to, to service each side of the consumer groups to prepare something interesting for them. Moreover, we also are looking into the industry how we can create special products for and within the industry. The important part that we also uh, came across was when you have those different groups of products, you need special forces for each of those groups. If you're using the same team of people, most likely they will not focus in a sufficient manner on all of your products. In our case, we, we have a separate division, which is the final rare division, and we have separate managers dedicated only to that portfolio. We have uh, coffee, we have uh, been doing cigars, we need separate people also for, for the division, otherwise it doesn't work. We tried it, you lose the focus. The creation process, and this is something what I really enjoyed on, on your know, slide, Pete. Uh, in our case, we, we always thought that um, the creation process can eat your product alive because it lasts too long. So we believe that it's better to start with something that has less chances to succeed, but to start and then fix things as we go. It's a little bit crazy and dangerous, but in our case, it proved to work. Otherwise, we would sit in the boardroom for weeks trying to come up with the perfect idea rather than try to actually make business. So that's what we've been doing. Facilitate your communication appropriately to each of the channels. Your consumers that uh, drink your entry-level spirits will demand different communication than the connoisseurs or collectors that are after your final rare portfolio. Um, your, your, your coffee drinkers will absolutely visit different websites and, and, and different media uh, than to those uh, consumers that smoke your cigars or drink your rums, vodkas, wines, and so on. So as you build, make sure that you don't use the same channels for communication for all your, all your products. Now, this is how our portfolio is structured right now. So we started with our entry level products with 12, 20 year old XO, which is a blend on average 25 year old rums. And the first gins that, was made, that were made from sugar cane that were matured in our rum barrels. Now, this is how we started back in 2009. Um, as we progressed, we uh, decided to add another category, which for us, we're lucky because we have that old rum. Actually, we have one of the oldest rums on the planet right now in our possession. Um, so we've managed to be able to offer to consumers a fantastic adventure to discover our 40, 35, 45-year-old rums, uh, where we decided also to be as creative as possible to, within the final rare portfolio, create different groups of products, which I'll show you in a second. Then another uh, thing that came to our mind is that h drum is still a small category around the world, so you need to give people some experience to discover it. Hence the idea of cigars and the coffee, because what better experience than to go to a bar, have your rum on the rocks, then follow up with a nice uh, shot of espresso from uh, Colombian Arabica, or just have a cigar while you're drinking it. So it's a portfolio that is surrounding our core, which are the spirits. Now, as we did business, we realized there is a need for another group of products, private label. Some of you, obviously, are trying to pitch to, to biggest chains of specialty stores or supermarkets 
very often those customers like to have something exclusively made for them. So while you're building your portfolio, it can be a tremendous uh, benefit and added value for your sales if you come up with something that will be exclusive to certain partners. Now, there is a world beyond that. Hashtag art distilled. I'll not speak too much about it, but if you would like to discover where we're going next, uh, please check it out and you'll see how very much beyond spirit business you can grow with the, with the brand. So here's a little twist on our final air portfolio. So we have RAM matured under the sea. We have the two masters project, which is a phenomenal thing where we send uh, some of our oldest RAMs, on average 40 year old RAMs, to respected houses around the world. So we have some of our RAMs aged in Glen Farkle's barrels in their distillery in Scotland. We have uh, some of our RAM aged by Hardy Cognac uh, in France. We have fantastic partners now from US, uh, from our importer partner Sazerac, where we teamed up with one of their distilleries, Barton, where they're aging some of our rums as well. So it's a global project of partnerships uh, and is bringing rum to a completely new category. Because if you're a whiskey drinker and you're a collector and you were never into the rum world, what, what better way to introduce you to it is if not trying the 40-year-old rum from a 50-year-old uh, Grand Farkle's uh, whiskey barrel. So around that, you can also build different groups of, 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 of customers and uh, target your audience in many different ways. Now, let's not forget about our industry of its own. Right now, Dictador has created the most secure label on the planet. We did the premiere of that two weeks ago in New York City. Um, yesterday, we're lucky to be published uh, with a few first articles from Fox Business. This is the most secure label on the planet. We teamed up with one of uh, the Euro banknote manufacturers uh, who helped us create a patent on, on creating that label with absolutely unique 11 protection systems. So right now, this technology becomes our new portfolio because we already talked to other brands that are interested in securing their very, very old uh, bottlings with our label, obviously with their design, but with our technology. So soon part of the Dictador portfolio, uh, you're looking at selling technology to other uh, market players. So do not limit yourself only because somebody said that you have to sell this one spirit that you, mm, that you started with. It's, it's, it's a big ocean and there's a lot, a lot to do which takes me smoothly to my red and blue ocean slide. Um, this is the core. This is the core of, of what our owner, our mentor always told us that within our company, we always focus on this approach, red and blue ocean. Why would you put yourself in an ocean full of blood and sharks and compete about, uh, against the biggest corporations on this planet if you can actually create your own ocean where you swim on your own or maybe with one or two competitors? It's, it's, it's absolutely uh, something that brought us where we are right now. We are, I believe we are one of the leaders in the age drum sector. And if we would follow the, the old examples of pirates and, and pirates and do as everybody told us to do, we probably wouldn't be here where we are right now. So uh, some people maybe think we're a little bit uh, loco, uh, but we're proud of it. And I think that's what makes us uh, different. Um, and I encourage you to, to be different in anything that you do. If you see all of those uh, mm, competitors in your category, think about what they're not doing and then do it. And to finish up, um, soon you'll be able to see one of the biggest modern art museum that is located in our uh, distillery in Colombia. Uh, the works recreated on canvas will be exhibited around uh, modern art museums around the world and it's part of our charity foundation. So again, it, it's growing. The concept is growing beyond the RAM itself. And I encourage you not to limit yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. So to start off, um, I wanted to, let's all just reiterate and get back on the same page. Tell me how many core brands each of you have. Core, core? That core skews, yeah. Co core skews, skews, three. In total. Okay. Uh, in the unit, nine. Nine, okay. I, I have to uh, be a little small rebel, and I have to tell you that we have core two categories. I wouldn't call it two as SKUs. I mean, in terms of our two masters project, it's, it's really 
all of them are our children, so we have to respect them equally. And how did you each establish which brands or SKUs would be the core? Did you choose ahead of time, or did you let the consumers choose? I chose ahead of time. You know, I, they're, they're reputation builders at, at this stage of our this stage of our growth. They have to be very, very solid, well established subcategories. So I chose ahead of time. Uh, we did two approaches. Um, the first is uh, consumer led. So we, we we asked the consumers essentially uh, what they were buying, and uh, especially with our whiskies. You know, we were able to see the, 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 the three that are within our core range. Mm -hmm. um, they were bought a lot more, so that kind of validated that. Um, but we've also got global brands um, that need to get push as well. So, so we line up with the rest of the world in terms of our core range and get our validation from consumers. So we try and do both. In our case, we really listened to our heart. We, we, we tried the juice and the, the two masters project and... It was so phenomenal that uh, we felt it has to be something we really want to share with the world and be proud of it. But we still needed a little bit of a business approach as well, not just passion. Although we, we call ourselves more for artists and businessmen. But um, uh, we, we contacted Harrods in, in London and then we also met with Sherry Lehman, which is one of the best uh, wine stores in New York. They both jumped on board. They said they want to be the first exclusive partner, so they all stocked up the products. So that was our confirmation that what, what the heart said was, was right. Okay. All right. So now we've established the core products. Let's talk about extensions. So is there a ballpark timeline for how long it takes from inception to get a product, a new product on the shelf? Or is it very depending on the company? Well, we are a really small business. So we, can have, we, we have to have sort of rapid turnaround. So we do, we'll do like two months for, for collaborative blends that we do with people. But again, we're a very small business, so we have the capability. We have to be nimble, so our timelines are probably shorter, and the runs are shorter than, than any other, than, than the larger guys, but ours is pretty quick. Okay. Um, that's a good question. Is there a certain timeline to, to add extensions? I don't think there is a certain timeline at all. You know, you look at something like Hendrix, they released a new extension, what, last year after 15 years in the market sure. for the first time. So, you know, but, but then you have other guys that are bringing out things every couple of days, weeks. Um, I think that it's really just up to how secure you feel within your brand and, uh, and, and then listening to the market as well. You know, you're... Your distributors have a huge amount of input into into what your product portfolio looks like. For example, you know a, a Canadian buyer, LCBO might, might might say that that they absolutely would want to take your core range, but they also want something specific to them. Then, if it works in that market, it could be extended out into your global, um, you know, extent, extension range, whatever you want to call it. Um, I don't think there is a set timeline at all, though. I think, I think that it's really just about opportunity and about, and about seizing them when you can, or perhaps observing the market to see if there's going to be a better time. Okay. In the beginning of our adventure, when we were still uh, more carefully listening what the industry representatives has to have to tell us, we always consulted with them whether it's a good time to, to launch the new extension. So we always heard it's before Christmas or after Christmas or before Easter, after Easter. So we really realized that there is no bad time. You have to just do it. And I agree with Pete that if you feel comfortable with what you have to offer, just, just do it. I mean, I'm promoting Nike now, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any uh, audience questions? How do you go about discontinuing decisions. So adding to the portfolio, but really the opposite of making sure it doesn't get too big or what are the criteria and you know, how do you time it? Uh, if I may, because I forgot to mention that was on my actually slide, that if, if you feel that it's dragging you down, you need to make this decision very quickly. The, the, the biggest mistake that you can do is to try to resurrect things that the public is not in favor of. So in our personal case, as our company, 
uh, had those experiences in the past. We, we, we launched a younger RAM for the mixologists. Um, we even actually started with a research. The research was positive, but in the end it worked out that it didn't make any sense because all the bar space is contracted by the major players. Um, so the sooner you can do it, the better. The first time you do it, you, 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 cry, your, you, you cry your eyes out, but uh, after some time you become cynical and if the product doesn't work within the first six months, cut it off. I think, yeah, that the, the idea is to fail fast and fail cheap, right? You don't wanna, it can get very expensive to, to try and push something up a hill. Um, What, what we do is, is, is this gate system where we try and ensure success. So from a very, very small idea, we try and make sure that, that, that we have enough, enough demand to be able to put it into a small scale production, which then goes to a large scale production when we, when we find that, that it's gone well. And we've had a lot of products that, that, that haven't made it past a small scale. A lot of products that really haven't at all. I think you know, from from doing over I think two hundred different lines, we've really only got about four actual brands that that that, that are in global stage. So you you need to sometimes kill your angels by by saying this isn't working, even though we love it. It's not working for for the market, and really just be respectful and responsive to to, to the to the desires and, and and trends that are going on. Yeah, I think, I think for us, um, that's been very carefully stage managed. You know, we, I normally have a home for a product before it goes out the door. So with any of our special releases, the, high, the most likely scenario is, is that I have a purchase order sitting in the back and I know exactly when it's shipping and then I know it's going to sell out because I know the people who I'm releasing it to are behind it and are going to move it. So... It, it's almost like, a, I don't know, a collection of drums, our portfolio. You know, I have the core range that are keeping the beat and the background the entire time. They're bigger runs, but there's this consistent sort of upward rate of sale. And then my, my limited releases are almost like cymbal crashes. You know, they're out, they're sold, they're gone. I don't want to have that problem where I've got a failed product on our hand. And to date, we, we've never, we, we haven't had that issue yet because we, we, we keep it really tight in that regard. I love that analogy. Yeah. I'm definitely <laughs> going to use it. I, I just thought of it now. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any more audience questions? Okay. Well, all right. I just want to thank our speakers today for participating in Park Street University. It was a pleasure to have all of you.